This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and this is the late 2016 Apple 13-inch MacBook Pro, the base model, the 1499 model that doesn't have the new touch bar strip above the keyboard, so slightly more normal, slightly less expensive. Still, considerably more money than the 13-inch MacBook Air that Apple says this will replace, and also it's $200 more than the previous 13-inch MacBook Pro. What's going on here? What have we lost? What have we gained? Watch now. So the late 2016 base 13-inch MacBook Pro, this is the one that is $14.99. It replaces, according to Apple, both the 13-inch MacBook Air that was priced around $1,000, but hey, you get a better screen here and faster CPU, and also the $12.99 previous entry 13-inch MacBook Pro. Ooh, that's getting a little tougher. So a little background here. This is Mobile Tech Review. This is Lisa. I'm the person who's unbiased and fair. And that's what kind of my reputation. But I'm probably going to be a little bit more cranky than usual in this video. Why? Because I've been using Macs since, well, probably before some of you were born, like the late 1980s, really, really that long. And uh, this is a little bit of a heartbreak here, what, what Apple's done to their so-called pro laptops that are supposed to be for pro users who need a lot of ports, a really good keyboard, all those sort of things. So just as a starting point there for background. And, you know, this is one of those Apple cuts everything away generations. But previously when they did that, they were, you know, they're ahead of the vanguard there. They got rid of the floppy drive first, if you're old enough to remember the floppy drive. They got rid of the optical drive, the DVD drive. That was okay. That worked out. So that the rest of the industry followed through. They got rid of the headphone jack on the iPhone. I don't know if everybody's recovered from that yet. I'm not even that mad about that. There's a dongle adapter in the box for that. And, uh, Lightning headphones do allow for higher quality, but ironically here we have a laptop whose only legacy port is the headphone jack, so it's still here, folks. We have just two Thunderbolt 3 ports, also doing USB-C. Now, other laptops are moving that direction, too. We've seen the HP Spectre going that way. Dell has been cutting back on ports on the XPS 13 line and adding more of the Thunderbolt action, so... I'm not going to pick on this too, too much, except for the fact that with Apple, they make so few machines overall that it's kind of either a laptop or a big iMac where you're paying for the built-in screen every time. So a lot of people, I think, do buy Mac laptops to be their main machine. So it can be a bit inconveniencing when you're suddenly down to just those two Thunderbolt 3 ports. So I'll give Apple a little bit of a harder time than I would say for your average HP 13-inch Ultrabook, which is probably somebody's second machine and they have a desktop either at work or or at home, or a bigger laptop, maybe. Anyway, that brings in dongleitis. So here it is. And this is true of PC laptops, too, that are, are moving towards USB-C and Thunderbolt 3. Uh, if you need to have multiple ports, you've got one here that adds. This is made by Sateki, and it has your two traditional USB 3.0 ports pass through for USB-C charging, though that may or may not work depending on the laptop you're trying on it. you got HDMI here. Some of these third-party ones aren't too, too expensive. This one's about 60 bucks. So compared to the price of some Apple adapters, that's not bad. There's Apple's AV adapter. There's this Lumsing, a name probably that's not exactly a household name for HDMI. It works actually just fine on every laptop I've tested, including this Mac. There's Apple's $20 USB-C to USB adapter. There's display ports. So get ready for dongles. Get ready for some extra expenses. I'm going to throw up a little picture there just to show you some of your options. And hey, they didn't just cut back on that too. They cut back on the charger, believe it or not. Here's our wonderful Apple brick charger. It's been around forever. This one happens to be 61 watt hour. And much like the 12 inch mat Book, which is a, a compromised super ultra portable and you know you accept compromise because it's pretty teeny small it's a specialty sort of laptop you have your USB-C cable it is two meters or six feet that's an okay length and you know how Apple always has the removable prong adapter thing they still have it here and they gave you a secondary length of cord in case you needed to use it you know not you're not physically close to an outlet that's not in the box anymore either that's a $19 add-on from Apple as uh, you might have noticed by now, there is no SD card slot either. So a lot of journalists use Macs, and we do need the SD card slot. You may or may not, but also a lot of photographers use Macs. If you just look right here on YouTube and you look at Photoshop tutorials and photography tutorials, you notice a lot photographers are very often using Macs. So you're going to need an SD card reader. Well, that's something I haven't had in a while. It's back.
the light up logo on the back. Nope, it's just, just like the iPad, it's just shiny mirror metal. And also that's true of the 12 inch MacBook. So this really is the 12 inch MacBookification of the larger 13 and 15 inch Pro line. All right, before we all start crying in our beer or our milk, depending on your age range, there are some great things here, including the display. And we'll go into that in detail, but also the horsepower here, because finally Apple has updated the CPUs. Now the 13 inch MacBook Pro was not as behind as the 15 inch. It was running on Intel fifth generation Broadwell. So now they've moved it up to Skylake. Um, seventh generation KB Lake is out now for PCs, but only in the dual core Ultrabook 15 watt model. Ah, speaking of that, though, notice right here what CPU we have here, and the clock speed is 2 gigahertz. This, unlike previous 13-inch MacBook Pros, instead of running on that more higher-powered 28-watt CPU, this is running on 15-watt dual-core Ultrabook CPU, much like any Windows 13-inch Ultrabook. It's a slightly higher version of that, sort of like the higher-end Dell XPS 13 Skylake Edition. They're now moving over to KB Lake, too. But in that you get Intel Iris graphics. So a little bit more graphics punch than you would get with regular regular old Intel HD graphics. If you do move up to the 13 inch that has the touch bar strip above the keyboard, that one adds in a couple of important things. You get the 28 watt CPU. So you get more horsepower. You get faster Intel Iris 550 graphics, whereas this one has 540 graphics. And you get four Thunderbolt 3 ports versus just two on our little friend here. Now that one starts at $1,799, $1,800 there. So Apple has really raised prices considerably here. The trackpad. The trackpad is big enough to trap a gopher just about, isn't it? It's even bigger than the HP Spectre trackpad and they've been using some really big trackpads. Now in terms of the width of the trackpad it's actually about the same as the HP but the height is even bigger. So just to compare them. Here they are. The battle of the giant trackpads, right? Now I think Apple is doing that not because they think you're going to be finger painting on the trackpad. They're doing that because they're making up for the lack of a touch screen and giving you the largest possible touch interface. And I think the touch strip above on the more expensive models is also an effort to do that. In terms of performance, here's our Geekbench 3 scores. Uh, we don't run heavy-duty graphics tests on this because this is still integrated graphics. You're not going to see any really impressive numbers here. It's fast enough to run Civ 6, though, that's for sure. Now, that's about the same benchmark scores we saw for the outgoing 13-inch model because that had the 28-watt Intel Broadwell CPU. Intel really hasn't been focusing on increasing performance because they feel their CPUs are currently fast, pretty fast. They're really focusing more on battery life and reducing heat more than anything else and making the integrated graphics a little bit more punchy. Now, if you want to get a little more punch on this base model, you could spend $300 and move up to a Core i7. It's still the same dual-core 15-watt CPU that doesn't get you into the 28-watt CPU range. If you're spending $300, you probably should go with, with the one that has a touch bar up top. Even if you don't intend to use the touch bar, you're just getting more power in that machine for the same price. Also, you'll get faster RAM, too, in the, the upsell touch bar model. This one has 8 gigs of 1867 megahertz DDR3 RAM. You can get it with 16 gigs if you want, and that's $200 more. Our base model has a 256 gig PCIe NVMe SSD, as Apple has been using, and they're among the fastest you'll find in laptops. That hasn't changed. You can also get it with a 512 gig SSD and even a 1 terabyte SSD. Now on to some good stuff. It's now available in space gray, which is the model we have here, are the traditional silver aluminum. Aluminum Uta body construction, still the same overall look here, that nice cutout here to make it easy to open with one finger, stereo speakers flanking the keyboard, which is an intelligent place to put them versus firing at the table. And it's 14.9 millimeters. It got even thinner. I, I really didn't hear a lot of people saying, oh my God, my MacBook Pro is so fat. I wish it was thinner. But Apple is in love with thinness, and it's a half a pound lighter than the outgoing model, and that's really impressive. So now it's three pounds, whereas before it was, you know, a little on the heavy side compared to the competition. Three pounds is not so far off from Dell XPS 13. Okay, that's 2.6 to 2.8 pounds. That is the lightest of the light, but if you're talking about the HP Spectre X360 that we just reviewed, that one's 2.8 pounds. A lot of them are honing in around just a little bit still lighter than this, but you do get this super solid construction here, aluminum unibody. If you get your pentalobe 
screwdriver out. You can take the bottom off should you want to upgrade the SSD. Pretty much nothing is. Now, part of the way that Apple got this lighter is by actually reducing the battery capacity significantly. And interestingly, our lower end 13 inch MacBook Pro has a slightly higher capacity battery, 54.5 watt hour versus 49 point something on the touch bar model. I guess the touch bar and its circuitry actually take up some room. That's significantly below still the 74 watt hour battery that was in the old model, but aha, uh -huh, how did they do that? Well, by having a much more power efficient display, despite the fact that it's much brighter too. By the way, whenever you open the lid now, it's going to turn on the computer, even if it's completely shut off. Now, for folks like us, because we have to open and close it, examine it a whole lot, that makes us crazy. But normal people, usually you open your laptop because you want to use it. So you're probably going to be okay with that. Okay, now the good news, the really, really good news. This display is awesome. And I mean, I review literally more than 100 laptops a year. Look at plenty of them. I'm pretty picky because I'm a photographer. I took these photos that you're looking at right here. And, you know, Apple's 67% brighter, 25% more color gamut. They're not kidding. They really aren't. 516 nits of brightness. That's where our colorimeter measured with auto brightness off, which is insanely high. You very rarely you see a laptop with anything more than, say, 300 to 350. That's already considered pretty stellar. So, yeah, it's bright. And as usual, with Apple, reflectance is very low. It's a glossy display, but the reflections are just not going to bother you. If you're watching a movie, you're not going to be admiring your own visage there in the reflection. Color gamut, 91% of Adobe RGB, wowzers, very nice, and 87% of NTSC, of course, full sRGB coverage. And the nice thing is it's very natural, accurate looking color. You know, I like OLED displays, but the, the few that I've seen on consumer laptops so far have been a little Disney-esque in kind of pushing some colors beyond max. So this one, yeah, nice. 2.3 gamma from the factory. 2.2 uh, is actually correct. And usually Apple gets that right, but this is a pretty high spec display. It's probably hard to find a panel that has every characteristic perfect, even given the high price tag of this laptop. Contrast level, very impressive at 1140 to 1. That's because even at max brightness, and that's an extremely high max brightness, black levels are 0 0.45. That's very good. And uh, of course, black levels go down as you drop the brightness because doubtless you probably don't want to use this at 500 nits plus of brightness unless you're outdoors. Hardware white point, 7200 degrees Kelvin. As too high, it's above the ideal 65 to 6600 degrees Kelvin, but many laptops are high, in fact, if not higher than that. And with calibration, it calibrates to be very good, spot on, so okay with that. Really, 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 really nice display. It's my favorite thing about this. Okay, keyboard, on to the, once again, not so jolly part of this. At least if you, for you, content creation involves a lot of typing, a lot of written words. For me, it does. If For you, if you're more of a photographer, this probably doesn't matter so much. But uh, yeah, this is my actual personal 15-inch MacBook Pro. Uh, the Obviously not the one with the touch strip. That's going to be out in a couple of weeks, and we will be reviewing that too. And you can see the key height on this. Normal keys, very nice to type on, all that good stuff. And over here we have the little 12-inch MacBook with the butterfly keys, the one that started it all for Apple with the dumb switches under here. And you probably can't hear any clicking because these keys, you can feel a little bit of a click, but really nothing much happening here. So, so-called second-generation butterfly keyboard here, same amount of key travel or lack of key travel, 0.5 millimeters, but it feels a little more clicky. You can actually hear a click. And that does help. It does help with the typing experience. Um, I've never been able to type on the 12 inch MacBook really reliably at all. This one I can. I don't enjoy the feeling of it. I make more mistakes, but it is more usable. If you're a writer though, you're probably just never going to really love this keyboard. It's just, you know, odd. It just doesn't feel like a normal keyboard and there's almost no tactile feedback in terms of keystroke, that sort of thing. A little bit more click. That is what it is. So once again, this comes with a 61 watt hour charger. Let's hear for round numbers there. And USB-C slash Thunderbolt 3 style connector. You can plug this into either of the two Thunderbolt 3 ports. It doesn't matter which, but obviously it's going to use up one of those. So, uh, 
when you only have two, it's you're a bit more port constrained. And again, it kind of I think Apple's really trying to lean you toward the 1799 model with the touch bar up top. They claim 10 hours on a charge. So this isn't the Energizer Bunny that was the MacBook Air where people were going up to like 14 hours, but that's still pretty darn good in the world of laptop laptops as they be right now, i.e. Windows laptops too. We're still testing battery life. We've had this in-house for a couple of days now. And so far, you know, Apple is usually accurate with their claims and they have been here too. Running this at about 150 nits brightness and doing productivity and streaming video, it's running for about 10 hours or so. And back to the good things again. Boy, this is just sort of like manic depression, isn't it? <laughs> I I'm really happy with how Apple smallified this. It has a smaller footprint than the 13 inch MacBook Air, and that really does make a difference for portability. And, you know, PC manufacturers are doing that as well, too. This is the HP Spectre X360 underneath it, which is a 13.3 inch Windows KB Lake Ultrabook. And you can see they have pretty close to the same footprint. And in fact, the Mac isn't any taller, despite the fact it has a higher, taller screen ratio going on right here. So really compact. And as a MacBook Air replacement, were it not for the part where I'd have to tell you guys you got to spend $500 more, I, <laughs> the price was lower if it was $12.99. I'd be so much happier. And I would say, you know, the dongles, that, that's going to be the problem everybody's having no matter what laptop they get pretty soon. But the display is so much better. The MacBook Air TN panel is just sort of like watching an old 480p tube TV versus getting your first 1080p LCD flat screen TV. So much nicer. The build quality on this, the rigidity on this, it's the same weight as a 13-inch MacBook Air. Those are great selling points there. But again, you know, you're paying a lot for that transition since Apple's killing off the 13-inch MacBook Air and the 11-inch MacBook Air as well. If you were a 13-inch MacBook Pro user um, and you don't have an, any interest in the touch strip on this, you know, yeah, it's obviously the most affordable way that you can go. But keep in mind that you're going to be more port constrained with only two ports here instead of having four Thunderbolt ports on the 13 inch higher end model. Also, you're gonna, not going to get that faster CPU. A lot of Mac people buy a Mac laptop and they keep it for a long time, four or five years. And it helps, you know, because they usually come with pretty good, strong CPUs to start with. So this one, yeah, this is not as future proof as the more expensive 13 inch Pro model is. And there are some intangibles here, or kind of tangibles, I don't know, in a certain kind of way. Apple support is still very good. I mean, there are many Apple stores. You can walk into the Genius Bar and get help. Their phone support people are very nice. They're, they're not script monkeys the way some PC manufacturer support lines are. And they kind of have a customer is right attitude, which is refreshing. So that's something to keep in mind too. You know, and also for those of you who just love Mac OS, some of you are going to buy this just because you've been using Macs and you love Macs. And well, if you really want Mac OS, well, here's your laptop. So there it is, the 13-inch MacBook Pro, for better or worse. It's still a beautiful machine. It's just gorgeous to look at, stunningly made, of course, obviously very thin. Apple is obsessed with thinness. The display is stunning. It's hard to find something more pleasing. I mean, it's up there with OLED, but a little bit less exaggerated and cartoony looking. It's still that wide color gamut. But, you know, we've lost a lot of ports here. We've lost our SD card slot. We've lost half of the charger cable here. And we have the new hardly moves at all kind of keyboard, which is an acquired taste, which you know my feeling. For, for the 12-inch MacBook, that makes sense as small as possible. Make it portable. It's a specialty machine. But for something you call your pro machine, where content creation, including the written word, could be important, I think the keyboard's not really up to snuff. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Be sure to visit our website for the full written review and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more cool tech videos, including the Touch Bar MacBook Pros. Oh, and if you liked the video.